welcome, and thank you for joining us today for the NCI Community Oncology Research Program Community Sites RFA webinar. My name is Jennifer, and I will be your WebEx host. Before I move into introducing our speakers for today, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping details. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. Please submit your questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A or chat panel and select all panelists from the drop-down. We will ask as many questions as time allow, allows during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you need to view live closed captioning, please refer to the media viewer panel. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted online in the near future. We also have a feedback survey. Please take a moment to complete that at the end of today's webinar. And now I'd like to turn it over to our speakers, Orta McCaskill-Stevens and Ann Geiger. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Orta McCaskill-Stevens. I am the Chief of the Community Oncology and Prevention Trials Research Group, which houses the INPOR, which I am the Director. And we are in the, I am in the Division of Cancer Prevention. And this is Ann Geiger. Thank you all for coming. I am the scientific lead for the NCOR Cancer Care Delivery Research Portfolio. And I am also Deputy Associate Director of the Healthcare Delivery Research Program in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. So this afternoon, I would like to uh, begin by giving a brief background of the INCOR program, give an overview of the RSA, and then we're going to have a question and answer session that we're going to lead. And this is a selection of questions that we have gathered uh, from you uh, as an audience and, and potential applicants. Um, i just like to say up front that we wanted to do this presentation today for the general audience. We won't be addressing specific scientific aims or specific questions about your, um, your oncology practices. <clears throat> so let's begin with background. Um, the INCOR was established in 2014. It was a program uh, that was built upon a legacy clinical trials network that also combined uh, some of the elements of the NCI Community Cancer Centers program and an expansion to include cancer care delivery to research. The foundation of our program is based on the premises that we understand that the majority of care is given in the community setting and that the program has sustained over time and that we have incorporated new technologies and our programs have demonstrated the nimbleness of the programs to adapt to health practices and changes in, in the communities as well as adapting to new technologies. Our overarching goal is to improve patient outcomes and reduce cancer disparities by bringing clinical research into the communities where individuals um, live. The community-based uh, program designs and conducts clinical trials and other human subject studies. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about other human subjects, as many of you know, with our advanced technologies, uh, both in uh, treatment as well as in other uh, research portfolios within NCOR, uh, have uh, begun to focus on molecular characterization, and this is encompassed by human subject studies as well. We um, have research for adults and children in cancer prevention, control, screening, and care delivery, as well as our quality of life studies that are embedded within treatment trials. We have a very large uh, dispersed program throughout the country, as you will see in a few slides, um, but it gives us an opportunity to engage diverse populations into our research. That is including the uh, adolescents and young adults in an emerging field, the elderly, racial and ethnic populations, sexual and gender minorities, as well as rural populations uh, into our study. Um, our program enhances patient and provider access to treatment and imaging. We work very closely with the NCI Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis. We also utilize much of their enterprise system for data management, enrollment, et cetera. So our investigators have been participating in treatment and advanced imaging for quite some time, and this will continue within this cycle of NCOR. We also integrate cancer disparities into our program, and that means that we're not only interested in just the enrollment and in enhancing underrepresented population, we'd also like to have identification of specific cancer disparities research throughout tumors as well as various treatment modalities. 
This particular session is focused on the community sites. Um, community sites are a consortium of hospital practices and other uh, oncology um, uh, permutations that accrue patients to clinical research studies. This is RFA. 18061. I hope you have dialed into this, to that one. Um, but I would also encourage you to review the research basis, which is essentially the hubs that provides the scientific leadership uh, and the structure that supports the community sites as well as the minority underserved sites, and is involved in implementation and analyses of the clinical research that uh, is developed. So please review the research basis of the minority underserved sites that you have an understanding of how the three components of our program um, interact. Our program, uh, as I mentioned, is geographically diverse. Um, the Board of Scientific Advisors did uh, uh, approve us to uh, hopefully expand in this program to make sure that uh, individuals have access to our our, our research. There are currently 34 community sites and 12 minority underserved um, sites. I would strongly encourage you to go to our website. There is a very uh, nice interactive map which allows you to understand that it's not just the icons that you see on the map, but the various affiliates and sub-affiliates uh, and how they traverse states. I think one important thing that you might want to consider if you have a practice that traverses states of having an understanding that there may be different regulatory or other issues that influence clinical trials that may be state-specific. I'm now going to go into the overview of the uh, RFA. Just a few comments about our scientific scope. In the area of cancer control research, our goal is to reduce comorbidities associated with cancer and its treatment. We often uh, include, and a predominant part of that are what we call uh, toxicities related to cancer and its, and its treatment as well as improving the quality of life of individuals undergoing cancer treatment and those with a history of cancer. We have uh, a growing uh, area of cancer prevention research to reduce cancer risk, incidence, and mortality. I would encourage you as you think about this to think about where the at-risk populations are and who are the practices that are engaged and might be the referral basis uh, for this particular area of research. We have cancer care delivery research to improve clinical outcomes and patient well-being by intervening on patients, clinical clinicians, as well as organizational factors uh, that influence care delivery. And this was an important uh, expansion of the NCORE program at its inception in 2014. The community site activities um, include increasing involvement of community oncologists and other medical specialties that interact with the oncologists um, and patients as well as advocates um, in the activities. Um, the community sites will interact with the research basis. This is an important opportunity for the community sites to provide input on clinical significance and feasibility doing concept development. This is done in various ways or opportunities for community representatives to participate in uh, NCI-related uh, research review bodies as well as advisory opportunities. Um, it also provides the sites to identify cancer disparities in their own specific and local populations that they can bring to the table for trial design as well as other research opportunities. Study specific activities. Um, the sites are required to enroll a minimum of 80 unique participants including members of underrepresented population. This should be as close to 50-50 as you possibly can get. Remember, this is the minimum. Um, beginning in the cycle of the NCOR, we will be assigning uh, the requirements um, to the cancer control and prevention and to the treatment to uh, hopefully ensure that we get that balance. Um, there is a minimum of three cancer care delivery protocols per year for uh, the adult sites and two for pediatric only sites. Sites are, are encouraged to participate in in-core initiatives to document enrollment and screening. Uh, for existing sites, we have a, uh, a, a clinical trial law to which uh, is, um, all the site participating sites, this is a requirement. For new sites that are not using this particular document, if you have a tool that is capturing the effort that you uh, perform in terms of enrollment or your, your denominator, then please include that in your application. Community site activities also include gathering biospecimens 
that will be banked into the in-core research base, um, and they will be trial specific. In terms of community site structure and eligibility, um, this is a change in nomenclature for existing sites, but for new sites, the terms that we're using for the components of the program are the hospitals, cancer centers, physician practice, and other institutions that enroll patients on a regular and ongoing basis. Sub-affiliates are practices or organizations that also contribute enrollment, but this goes to the primary affiliates, but it's located in a separate geographic location and is a part of the primary affiliates business entity. Um, just a little bit about eligibility. Applicants for the community sites must be healthcare providing entities and cannot be an NCI designated cancer center, cannot be an awardee of the NCTN lead academic participating site of the National Cancer uh, Treatment um, Trials Network. Um, a veterans affairs uh, institution cannot be the primary recipient of the grant but can be a sub affiliate and it must be uh, within the United States. However, you can be uh, U.S. territory, so that would include Puerto Rico, Guam, Virgin Islands, and other uh, U.S. territory components. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Geiger. Thank you. I'm going to walk through a few important specifics related to your application. I would first like to make sure that everyone understands the award mechanism, which is a UG1, Clinical Research Cooperative Agreement, single project with a clinical trial required. Clinical research is defined by NIH and, in brief, involves direct interaction with human subjects. You can see more about the details of that definition at the link that is provided. The term cooperative agreement refers to the role that NCI staff take in the activities. And after award, we will be providing assistance, guidance, doing project coordination, and participating in some of the scientific activities. The term single project refers to all the NCORE related activities you are undertaking. And clinical trial required indicates that these grants include the conduct of studies that meet the NIH clinical trials definition. I want to share some very important information about clinical trials and human subjects that will have changed since the last application process. Please note that the RFA contains some very specific instructions about how to complete the, these components of the application. In brief, on the SF-424 form, on the other project information form, you will need to answer yes to the question, are human subjects involved? However, you should not propose specific clinical trials in your application, which means that the study record should not be completed. For those of you who are renewal applicants and new applicants, you must complete the delayed onset study record and select anticipated clinical trial. And again, please, please review the RFA and follow the instructions exactly as published. This is the community site webinar, and so we have a few specific recommendations and reminders for you. Again, new and renewal applications are being accepted. There is no limit to the budget. However, the budget you submit needs to reflect the actual needs of your proposed project. We want to remind everybody that this is a six-year project period, so your budget should encompass a six-year period. We have requested a letter of intent, which helps us in planning our scientific reviews, but you are not required to provide the letter of intent. And again, please follow instructions that are um, linked here. So timeline, the RFA was released in mid-June, and we are asking, please, that you send letters of intent by July 31st. Again, these are not required, but are very helpful for us in planning the review. The applications are due on August 31st. Late applications will not be accepted. 
The scientific merit review we anticipate will occur in spring of 2019, and it is our goal to make awards in August of 2019. And the six-year performance period would then, we hope, be August 1st, 2019 to July 31st, 2025. And I apologize, I should have noted earlier that when you submit your letter of intent, you will receive a notice that it has been received here at NCI. There are a number of helpful resources available to you as applicants. We have separated them into two groups because it will help you more quickly get the information you need. This slide addresses the mechanics of completing the application. Our program staff in the Division of Cancer Prevention and the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences are unable to assist with these sorts of questions. I want to call out the SF-424 instructions. These are a very detailed guide to the form. It includes an item-by-item -item set of instructions, and we are hearing from applicants that this is a very useful resource. So if you have questions about the application, that may be a good place to start. The second set of information resources we have here relates to the particulars of the RFA and programmatic considerations. And this is where my colleagues in our two divisions can provide some assistance. I want to note that we are going to have a frequently asked questions document that will be posted soon, hopefully next week, and it will be updated periodically. And I will note that we have received over 100 questions to date, so this is a very rich resource. If you have questions about the RFA or specific things related to the science of your application, Again, this would be a great place to go and see if that question has been asked and answered already. I also want to call your attention to the program guidelines, which is the second link. This is a roughly 100-page document that contains extensive information about NCORE activities and processes. I think it will be useful for all applicants, perhaps particularly useful if you are a new applicant. And finally, we have provided a staff email box. We are monitoring this on an ongoing basis and responding to questions as promptly as possible. And with that, I think we are going to enter our question and answer period. Thank you, Warda and Anne, uh, for a great conversation. I'd like to jump into questions from our audience. As a reminder, you can ask questions by typing it into the Q&A or chat box and selecting all panelists. Now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Kate. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, and I wanna say thanks to everyone who has sent questions in um, in advance of the webinar that helped us greatly in preparing for the, today. Many of the questions that you have sent will be uh, addressed today, but as Ann mentioned, in addition, the FAQ document will be available in the next two weeks, one to two weeks, and it will be a great resource for you. Um, again, we wanna note the key resources that we really, really encourage your teams to use. The SF-424 instructions document provides extremely detailed information on um, how you complete your application and the Form E instructions as well. We also have the assist resources and the help desk that's available. So there are a lot of resources already available for you in assisting you to complete your application. Um, we're gonna move forward now with um, fielding some of the questions that have come in while we've been on the webinar and also um, in preparation for the webinar. The first question is, does the PI of an NCORE grant need to be an MD? And Kate, the answer is no. The PI does not need to be an MD. Great. Um, are uh, the evaluation criteria, approach, study design, statistical management analysis um, sections of the review seem more geared toward a specific study. How do we apply this content to our NCORE site application? Those are standard NIH evaluation criteria. However, if you read the RFA, you will note that there are review criteria that are specific to this FOA. Reviewers will be considering both the standard and the FOA specific criteria when conducting their reviews. And I should say FOA refers to funding opportunity announcement and in this case is synonymous with 
RFA or request for applications. The next question, are P30 funded NCI cancer centers excluded from the community site RFA? So cancer centers may apply to be an NCOR research base. That webinar will be at 3 o'clock today. They may also apply to be a minority underserved community site with appropriate justification per that RFA, which will be discussed at 2 o'clock. However, P30 funded cancer centers may not apply to the community site RFA we are currently discussing. Our next question, uh, is NCI reducing the total number of NCOR grantees? So our Board of Scientific Advisors at NCI, when they approved reissuance of this RFA, allowed for a maximum of seven research-based grants, 14 minority and underserved grants, and up to 40 community site grants. The number of community and minority and underserved sites is slightly higher than is currently funded. However, final decisions about how many awards are made will be based pending available funds. Um, will the high-performance sites be continued? Yes, the designation of high-performance sites and standard sites will continue. Uh, this designation of high-performance and standard sites will be made after applications have been selected based on the applicant's past accrual performance, and the NCI will establish the threshold for those two designations. Thank you. Um, Regarding biosketches, um, do we have to submit a biosketch on every investigator since the information has already been scanned into the system as part of the credentialing requirements for NCTN and NCOR? To clarify, the credentialing system is something that currently funded community sites participate in. That system is known as the NCI Registration and Credentialing Repository, or RCR. Unfortunately, that system does not interface with the grant submission system, so reviewers will not have access to any information in that system. So you can find additional instructions and information on biosketches at the grants.nih.gov site. And just to be clear, you will need to provide a biosketch for key personnel as defined there. Um, and the next question I'm going to pose to Amy, who is our colleague from the Office of Grants Administration. Is the expectation that the RFA application is to be IRB reviewed prior to submission, or can it be after submission since we only have 60 days to um, prepare our application before the August deadline? The IRB review documentation will be required for applicants who are funded as NCORs. It will be a just-in-time requirement, which means that it's due after the application has been reviewed and scored, but must be submitted prior to an award being issued. This should provide sufficient time for the sites to obtain IRB review and approval. And we also want to note we've received uh, quite a few questions asking if the NCI Central IRB will be the IRB that will review the NCOR grant applications. And we want to be clear that no, the NCI Central IRB does not review grant applications. The Central IRB reviews protocols on behalf of the NCOR site. So the Central IRB will not be reviewing your grant application. Um, we have a couple questions now related to catchment area. Um, word of the first question is regarding the catchment area. Is the entire geographic area of a cancer center, or is it the specific area from which patients are coming? Applicants uh, for this particular question should define the catchment area based on the characteristics and patient demographics for their individual site affiliates and sub-affiliates. And are there suggested resources for population demographic information, including by age category? Applicants should use institutional, local, state, or national data sources to determine the population demographics in their catchment areas. This can include U.S. Census data, for example. Uh, they need to only address the applicable patient population, i.e., adult providers don't necessarily need to do pediatrics unless they are adding in a pediatric population they'd like to um, describe their potential for having a mixed population, for example. 
And are we bound to the, um, the age uh, requirement limitation areas that were in the RFA, or can we provide um, age based on what data is available at our site? Uh, we would welcome uh, the intervals if they're available. If this is uh, a child term being challenging for the sites, then we would uh, encourage you to use whatever you have available for you as a source. Um, now we have a couple of questions related to uh, the tables and the table requirements. Are there table templates available to reference um, for the requested information? Yes, there are suggested table formats. We realize the link provided in the electronic version of the RFA is not taking you to the tables, but rather to the guidelines document. This has been corrected. The suggested table formats are available on the INCOR public website, which we encourage you to attend, and they will also be included in the Q&As that will be um, posted on the website. Uh, do we go back to previous program data for the five-year accrual table? So if you are a, an existing site, then the accrual information that we would request only goes back to the inception of INCOR, which will be August of 2014. If you are a potential applicant and new and have not been an, an INCOR site, uh, then you can exceed those times if that would be strengthening your application for your accrual. <clears throat> um, and I'm going to ask uh, Shamala from our DEA office to answer the next question regarding attachments. Should attachments one to three be uploaded in the appendix section? And are there any tables that we need to use as the highlighted information below refers to tables? Well, the three other attachments described in the SF424, other project information section of the RFA must be, should be uploaded into the item 12 other attachment of research and related other project information of the SF-424 form. Do not upload these documents into the appendix, appendix section. Only limited appendix materials are allowed. Um, so there is a notice, OD-17098, that please refer to that. Uh, this includes um, um, what should be attached, and it also tells you what is disallowed in the appendix. And if you put this allowed information into the appendix, um, please note that this would become non-compliant application, so be careful about it. Thank you. Uh, we now have some questions coming in related to the budget. <clears throat> How should the control prevention and cancer care delivery research budgets be broken out? So the budget form and the sub-award budget forms should include a total budget that covers both clinical trials and cancer care delivery research costs. So that would be cancer control and prevention and cancer care delivery. Applicants should include a separate item. So there will be a total budget, but the itemization should be separate for cancer and prevention costs versus cancer care delivery research costs for each budget period. And this is very important for applicants that in the budget justification, you clearly indicate the direct costs, indirect or F&A costs, and total costs, including both direct and indirect costs, separately for the control and prevention portion of your application and the cancer care delivery research application. So you will provide two sets of numbers of total direct, indirect, and total costs. The non-CCDR budget, that is the cancer prevention and control budget, should also include your costs that are associated with treatment trials and core infrastructure. And we have a, a, a series of budget questions coming in, so I'm going to address a related question, which is that cancer control, prevention, and treatment trials will continue to be assigned credits, as has been done for the past five years and in previous versions of this network. However, credits will not be assigned to cancer care delivery research studies, as has been the case the past few years. Note that there is a requirement that each site have three cancer care delivery research studies open each year, or two if you're a pediatric site. Budgets should be based on 
your site's need for personnel and resources to implement and accrue to CCDR studies. There are no credits for CCDR studies. I will also clarify that this requirement is not intended to imply that each year, each site will open three new studies. We would like you to have three studies open and accruing each year, be they continuing from a previous year or newly opened studies. And one last question related to budgets. For the CCDR budgets, is there a limit in the cycle of funding or is it up to the applicant to budget as appropriate for the program? Applicants should develop a budget appropriate for their program, which would be based on the site's resources, staff, and infrastructure requirements to implement and accrue to cancer care delivery research studies. There is no stated cap. Again, however, it needs to be appropriate for the proposed activities. And I'm going to reiterate again that in the budget justification, we need you to provide separate itemization for cancer prevention and control costs, also including treatment and imaging trial costs, and separately for cancer care delivery research costs. Thank you, Ann. Um, <clears throat> now we have some questions that have come in regarding um, the ASSIST and Forms E. Uh, this is the first time that we will be using the ASSIST system for submission. Uh, are there resources that can be developed and posted somewhere for all of us to access that would be very helpful? So I would like to call everyone's attention again to slide 19, which is the additional resources for NIH grants. Uh, the slide, the, these slides will be posted in the near future, but there is a web page about NIH Assist that includes a webinar, a step-by-step -step guide, and importantly, there is online help available. So again, these are questions that need to be fielded by experts in this area. We in the programmatic side in the divisions are unable to, to answer these questions. Thank you. And Shamla, I turn, I'll turn to you again for some questions now uh, regarding <clears throat> submission. If we are a current NCOR grantee and will be forming two new NCORs, will we both be considered new or would one of us be new and the other a renewal? So. Um, the original institutional recipient of the previous NCORE grant may submit the application as a renewal application because you're already funded. But if there is significant structural or programmatic changes of the, in the application, then you can decide to submit as a new application. However, uh, please contact the program staff to ensure that there is substantial changes. So take the decision with the program input, please. Thank you. And what is needed for the cover letter attachment um, that is requested um, in the uh, SF-424? One thing uh, applicants can, um, in theory, do is to suggest the fields which are not very obvious in a grant application um, for expertise request. Please do not suggest the names of peer reviewers, but you can suggest um, the types of science that might be in your grant application. Um, there is no need to do a study section request because it, all the applications will be reviewed in a special emphasis panel, so that is not needed. So I'm sorry I'm giving the not, but two not here. One is do not request a study section, do not suggest the names of peer reviewers. <coughs> Great. And we're getting uh, some questions. Uh, we've gotten some pre and during the webinar, too, regarding the uh, clinical trials and delayed onset um, uh, portions of the application. How do we complete the PHS human subjects and clinical trial information of the application? Do we include information for each of the studies that we are currently participating in? So um, applications uh, are not proposing any specific clinical trials at the time of the submission, as you all know. So inclusion of children, women, and minorities will not be provided for the delayed onset studies. However, in, the, in section D of the application of the research plan, 
uh, please provide the information specific to human subjects protection, data and safety monitoring, and standard operating procedures. And um, <clears throat> we've also had a question that's asked, so where can we find specific instructions regarding this? So if you go to the RFA, you will see the section that's uh, uh, subsection that has PHS human subjects and clinical trial information, it gives, gives specific directions uh, that you do not, that you do select human subjects, you do not um, complete a study record, you would not complete the inclusion enrollment form, but you would select delayed onset study, and then you will check the anticipated clinical trial box. You will see in the RFA, it gives you the exact title that you will put for the delayed onset, and it also gives you um, the justification that will, you will put into the box. So all of it is included in the RFA under the PHS Human Subjects and Clinical Trials information. And Kate, I'll note that's toward the end of Section 2, Section 4, Item 2 in the RFA. Um, and another question we've received in, in uh, clinical trial section, when it asks for the studies, can we make a general statement about the studies that we are participating in? Again, you do not complete the study record. You do not provide information for any clinical trials you are currently participating in. Instead, you complete the delayed onset study record, and it will be called multiple delayed onset studies. And we will provide... Um, specific information about this in the FAQ, and again, the SF-424 guidelines, I'll walk you through it as well. I just wanted to uh, add a couple more comments about the question related to changes in organizational structures for new applicants that they were previously funded. Um, we, as here, have encouraged those sites to talk to program director and to the Office of Grants Administration. For those sites who have already done so, whatever guidance was provided to you should be applicable. We have um, additional question uh, regarding cancer care delivery research. In this grant, can you clarify, will there be a minimum number of accruals that we need to have to CCDR studies? So we are going to address this in the FAQs in brief. I will now say that there are not cancer care delivery research accrual requirements. However, as I mentioned earlier, all sites will be asked to have a minimum of three open studies at any given time. And I'll also note that we periodically do assessments of the sites to gather some organizational characteristics, and we will expect that each site participate in those assessments. And Warda, an additional question regarding budgets has come in uh, regarding cancer control and prevention. Should our cancer control and prevention budgets be proposed based on cost reimbursement or credit basis? Both. Okay. Um, another budget question, uh, Priyanga. Uh, just to clarify on our budgets, the forms in assist do not allow separate lines for indirect rates. The breakdown should be outlined in the budget justification. Is that what you're saying? Uh, absolutely. The um, breakdown between control and prevention and CCDR should be included in the budget justification attachment. Thank you. Or to a question regarding research bases. Can you designate more than one research base? For instance, if adults in pediatric trials need one adult research base, can we select two and the COG research base? Yeah, we are not restricting affiliations with research bases for the community sites. Right? There are no restrictions. <clears throat> Those are all the questions I have at this time. Great. Um, thank you so much for such a, an active Q&A session um, and all of our attendees for your participation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a recording will be posted in the near future. The resources presented in today's presentation are available on the NCORE website, and the slide deck presented today will be posted at the end of today. Um, so please check back on that website probably around 5 o'clock, if not a little later. Please, continue, please feel free to continue the conversation via email if you have additional questions that were not answered during today's presentation. Thank you again for your participation.